shooting fans, stay tuned for the Smith & Wesson Winter Nationals in IDPA competition, the sport that's founded on handgun training. Plus, the heavy muzzle loaders shot off a chunk of wood to feed the family. It's chunk guns in break guns. And Bob Munden is smoking cigarettes with his smoking six guns. It's all today here on American Shooter. American Shooter is brought to you by Colt and the new Colt XS series. If it isn't a Colt, it's just a copy. And by Simmons, Rifle Scope Headquarters. Welcome to this edition of American Shooter. I'm Jim Scouton, and with all the new interest in concealed carry permits in some 40 states now, one of the fastest growing areas of the shooting sports is based on concealed carry handgun training. It's IDPA competition organized by the International Defensive Pistol Association. And one of the big events in IDPA shooting is the Smith & Wesson Winter Nationals, the next event in the American Shooter Championship Series. How's this for having a bad day? You're out to dinner and a gang of toughs attacks the bar and you have to shoot your way out. Later, you're back at your campsite trying to get a little shut-eye and you're attacked in the dark by three bears. So you go home and it happens again. Your house is under attack and you have to defend your family. Your bad day is all from the mind of Range Master Charlie Woolley. You'd be faced with a home invasion where hostage takers have invaded, perhaps a gang, uh, taking your kids hostages. And when shots are fired, people start moving. Uh, it involves moving targets, which may interfere with your engagement of a threat target. Of course, none of this is really happening, but the idea behind IDPA competition is that something like this could happen. And making a competition out of defensive handgun training is perfect for these times. As you well know in America, there's a big emphasis on people buying handguns for self-defense. And, and I'm like you and everybody else in the industry. We want people to do it safely and efficiently. We want them to put their best foot forward. So that's what really IDPA is about. Ken Hackathorn is a founding board member of IDPA as well as a firearms trainer and gun writer. And he's not the only well-known name in this sport. Here's Masada Yub shooting his way to two titles in the match. High senior, now that he's turned 50, and high gun press, the best score for the gun writers here. His years of studying and writing on tactics are an exact fit with this game. Yes, definitely. You've got uh, the, the emphasis on the use of cover, the emphasis on tactical movement, tactical uh, target engagement, and above all, safe handling of a gun under pressure when you know, all your peers are watching here. In the case of some, God help us, the camera's watching you. And you feel the heart kind of thumping here and the tongue kind of sticks to the roof of the mouth. Conditioning yourself to do that with a pistol on your hand makes you safer if and when you do have to draw the gun in time of crisis. This match is the Smith & Wesson Winter Nationals held in Smith's new multi-million dollar range complex in Springfield, Mass. And there are classifying stages in this sport, simpler challenges of accuracy and speed, to match up competitors with similar skill levels, from novice through expert and master class. Ed Schultz is shooting his first IDPA match and will be classed as a novice with his performance center semi-auto, even though he's the president of Smith & Wesson. What I try to do is to uh, get involved in a little bit of everything, and what turns out is that uh, I'm uh, involved in a little bit of everything and I'm not very good at anything. It falls to Tom Yost to be the Smith competition leader. You're watching him post the fastest time on this stage. Tom is a master class shooter who switched to IDPA competition after 20 years of shooting IPSC because of the real world rules. Well, you can use real guns that you carry on the street for self-defense. It's more realistic as far as having to use cover. Uh, myself, I do carry a gun at work all day, so it's close to what you may run into. Hopefully you're not gonna, but to prepare yourself, it's as close as you're gonna get. Make a note, bad guys, Tom's jewelry store is not the one to stick up in Manchester, Connecticut. 
But he's not the only one benefiting from competition and training. Yoichi Ota is the English interpreter for an elite security team visiting from the Japanese Coast Guard. Normally, they search ships, but here they've interrupted a robbery in progress on stage eight, and the challenge fits their training. They are taking IDPA's idea for their part of training. So it, it is very beneficial for them to shoot the match. You hear the same thing no matter who you talk to at an IDPA event. Good training made fun by the personal challenge of competition, along with the warning that you can't shoot fast enough to make up for missing. The targets have negative numbers outside the center of mass. One point off just outside the center, three points off in the fringe area, five down for a miss. Each point adds a half second to your overall time, and like in golf, the low score wins. In IDPA, it's critical that you have good hits. For every point down you're on the target, that's a half a second added onto your time. You cannot shoot fast enough to make up for that. There's just no way. And Ernest Langdon, former Marine firearms instructor and now Beretta technical advisor, did have good hits and the pleasure of taking the top title and the commemorative knife and buckle at the Smith & Wesson Winter Nationals for the second year in a row, edging Tom Yost by one and a half seconds in eight stages of fire. But you don't have to be a master class shooter to enjoy IDPA competition and you don't have to travel to Massachusetts to compete for money or prizes, because the real appeal of this game is as close as the handgun in your closet and your local range. We're not about winning big prizes or expensive uh, gifts and stuff. It's, it's all you're gonna win is a plaque or a trophy, and it's structured so that those people are competing against people in their own skill level. There's nothing very intimidating about it. Nothing intimidating about the events, but you'll be very intimidating if you ever need the skills that you can't help but learn shooting in IDPA competition. So are you getting interested? Log on to the IDPA website and search for a local club and get that carry gun of yours into action. And coming up, the best you might hope to find in a local club, a look at Smith's new academy. Well, I mentioned that it has been the demand for concealed carry permits that's made IDPA shooting the hot new sport. Well, it's also that same demand that motivated Smith & Wesson to build a state-of-the-art shooting facility. It's the kind of shooting club you only wish was in your neighborhood. Growth in IDPA competition is due in part to more and more states adopting concealed carry laws. And demand for training has grown as well as Smith & Wesson's Law Enforcement Academy found out when they decided to offer civilian courses. So we began to do some teaching to the civilian population with the same people and in the same facility that we were doing the law enforcement training. And it just became so popular that we ran out of people and places to do it. But Smith has solved that problem by spending more than $3 million to open the Shooting Sports Center, meeting the public's demand with more classroom space and some state-of-the-art ranges. We have 20 bays that people can come in and rent, bring their guns. They can rent guns. They can uh, get ammunition here. Next door, we have uh, two really nice training ranges with movers on them. A lot of people don't get an opportunity to shoot in some of the scenarios uh, at a regular range that you get to shoot in here. Safety on the range is a priority, of course, with bulletproof glass between the lanes, a two-way intercom with the range controller, and a computerized air filtration system that removes harmful contaminants, including lead dust. In addition to opening the new ranges to shooting clubs and the public, there's also a retail store selling everything from clothes to knives, guns, accessories, and ammunition. And there's even a mini museum in the store filled with historic guns from the company's past. Part of the history began in 1969 when Smith & Wesson's Academy opened and began providing specialized training to law enforcement officers from around the world. Well, that effort continues today. We have uh, empty hand defense courses, we have rifle courses, we have submachine gun courses, shotgun courses, so pretty much the full range of use of force topics. We also have an armor school here. And while the Smith & Wesson Academy stands as the oldest private shooting school in the nation, civilians take note. The state-of-the-art facilities just opened in the Shooting Sports Center 
may be the first of more to come. I think that this will probably be the first of I mean, hopefully many ranges. This is a real high quality place and it's, it's been a major investment, but it shows off in what you have. Smith & Wesson isn't yet ready with announcements about building other shooting sports centers around the country, but they have told us they're considering it. So cross your fingers, you might yet get the folks from Smith as state-of-the-art new neighbors in your town. Well, coming up, it's the homemade muzzle loaders and the competition that could take home a turkey. And then a new partnership for a very different semi-auto in GunTech. Bench rest shooting. These days, it's done with expensive rifles, high-powered scopes, and adjustable shooting rests. But the origins of this game have a much more common touch. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, the muzzle loaders were homemade, and the rest to steady the shot was a block of wood that gave the name to the competition. Great guns. Brought to you by Ruger, arms makers for responsible sportsmen. Sergeant Alvin C. York became a household name during the First World War when he single-handedly knocked out 35 German machine guns and captured 132 German soldiers. But long before the nation knew his name, York was already known for his marksmanship, regularly winning chunk gun competitions in his hometown of Pall Mall, Tennessee. More than 80 years later, the Alvin C. York Memorial Chunk Gun Shoot is held each summer in Pall Mall. The spirit of the competition has changed little since York competed to win food for his family's table before and after the war. They shoot for meat, just like they did when he shot. And they shoot at an X, just like they did when he shot. And they shoot over a log, like they did when he shot, and the same type guns. While today, most competitors dress in the style of the 1920s, Roland Cadell chose to wear his grandfather's army uniform. Kind of came down here in memory of, uh, of Sergeant York and the fact of my grandfather, always been interested in it, thought, can't hit the broad side of a barn, but I guess that doesn't matter down here. Chunk gun competitions began in the early 1860s. The name comes from the chunk of wood or log shooters use to steady their aim. The rules are simple. The target X's are placed under a sighting target 60 yards from the firing line. After competitors shoot 10 individual targets, the distance from the center of the ball to the X is measured on each target and added up. The shooter with the shortest total distance is the winner. A wide variety of rifles can be used in chunk gun shoots, but they must be flintlocks or percussion muzzle loaders. Turn of the century shooters used their hunting rifles, but over time, powerful target rifles with long, heavy barrels and special sights dominated the matches. Another trick learned early on was the use of sight covers, including some that run the full length of the barrel to sharpen the sight picture. Uh, if you've ever driven through a tunnel, and as you're coming out, things are really clear, well, this is the, the same concept. Past champion George Mitchell uses a front and rear sight cover on what he calls an extreme chunk gun. Nearly five feet long with a 54 caliber barrel, it weighs in at nearly 60 pounds. Weight, of course, is for, for extreme stability uh, when, it's, when it's on the chunk, and it makes it very easy to shoot. The caliber is quite large, so that there's not as much worry as, uh, for wind as there would be with a smaller hunting rifle. But whether shooting with target rifle or a stock gun, whether they finish first or last, all the competitors are keeping alive a shooting tradition for generations to come with the marksmanship skills of the uniquely American chunk gun. American Shooter presents Gun Tech, the latest in guns and shooting gear. Take a look at the latest from Smith & Wesson, well, actually from Smith & Walther. It's an extraordinary combination. The polymer receiver is from Walther in Germany, married to a slide and barrel made by Smith. The result is the SW99, which features not seen before on any gun, like the changeable back strap so you can shape it to your grip. It's double single action with a red cocking indicator at the rear. Firing is a striker action, not a hammer, and that puts the decocker on top of the slide. There's a choice of two calibers, 9mm and 40 S&W. 
It points well and the trigger is light and crisp in single action after the first shot. The SW99 is $735. Now, how are you going to carry it? Or your Colt or Glock or Sig or whatever? Well, here's some ideas from Kramer in leather or horsehide and even snake if you want some swagger in your concealed carry. Whatever, Kramer has models for most handguns made in the traditional water form method. They range in price from about $35 up to $75 in leather, somewhat more in horsehide, and a lot more in snake. Now this is Safari Land's newest idea in a paddle holster, the 560, made of leather finished Kydex that's heat formed to never lose its shape. The 560 has much greater gun retention than traditional leather holsters, and it's adjustable. The Safari Land 560 retails for about $80. Then there's one other way to carry, like a knife. This is the holster grip from North American Arms for their mini revolver, a single action five shooter chambered in 22 long rifle. Together, the grip and gun are $210. It's highly concealable. And while plenty of people will tell you this isn't enough gun for self-protection, maybe it is the answer to the question of what to carry to a knife fight. And that's gun tech. And coming up, Bob's picked up a smoking habit for the shot of the week. American Shooter is brought to you by Smith & Wesson, the world's largest manufacturer of handguns for sporting, law enforcement, and military use since 1852. And by Federal Ammunition, Federal Knockdown Power. You know, there's a whole bunch of ideas on the market that are supposed to help you quit smoking. Well, now we can add one more. Bob Munden. He's got a new plan for smoking cigarettes that will definitely have you keeping them away from your mouth. Here's Bob. Not until I started shooting guns did I realize that there were cigarettes in my life. No, I don't smoke them, not the conventional way, that is. No, I'm going to use a gun, and I'm going to shoot them in a variety of different ways. The first way we'll do is take one of these cigarettes, pull them out of the pack, stick it up on end, back off, and snap off a piece of that cigarette. What do you think? With a handgun, of course. Will we do it any other way? Of course not. Let's give it a try. You've got the width of the bullet to work with, and uh, that's what I do with it. I side it up, working, concentrating on my left and right, my windage. That's how you handle the vertical shot. That's one way to smoke a cigarette. Well, let's make it a little more difficult. Why do you say we put the cigarette horizontal and add a dimension to it while we're at it? On the horizontal shot, I have to start off on the other hand to a spot on the cigarette. I don't have the width of the bullet to work with this way, and your sights virtually cover up the target. You don't even see that cigarette when I line it up right. When the target's lined up behind those sights, it disappears. It's right about there. Boom. Well, that's called smoking them. Look at there. You can see where the bullet just cut a half moon right out of there. What do you mean? I didn't hit the whole thing in half. Okay, all right, you want a challenge? I'll give you a challenge. How about just the end of it? I'm not afraid. Let's give it a try. Basically, what you're doing is uh, shooting a bullseye, like an X-ring. Now, the X-ring happens to be, in this case, half the size of the bullet itself. So you have to place the bullet right dead center. Now, that's called smoking cigarettes. That's the way I do it anyway. Well, there it is. Nothing left on that cigarette but a paper itself that it was wrapped in. All the tobacco is gone. The bullet cleaned it, gutted it, per se. I know you folks that smoke cigarettes are crying in your beer because I wasted that good smoke. But it was a good shot. What do you think? Bob Munden here. See you next time. That was a great shot, Bob. Thanks. Now, here's what's coming for next week. It's an American Shooter exclusive, as we're the first to take our cameras inside the Federal Ammunition Plant to show you how they make rimfire, centerfire, and shot shells. Plus, the Scandinavian rifle design that armed the Rough Riders, the Craig Jorgensen, and Great Guns. And Byron Ferguson is both throwing and shooting for the shot of the week. For American Shooter, I'm Jim Scout, and I'll see you then. In the meantime, shoot safely and keep them in the 10 rig. Thank <laughs> you.